Um, thanks for having me. It's um, great to be here in front of all you guys and get to present my work and talk a little bit about it. Um, so yeah, my name is uh, Alan Maser. I'm, as Paul said, I'm from Dublin, Ireland. Um, I started. I started graffiti, pretty much. That's it. That was my introduction to art, and I started that um, actually 21 years ago. So it's quite a long time when I think about it now. But pretty much, what that consisted of back then, like it wasn't really, <clears throat> wasn't really like what uh, we know of it nowadays. Like you know, we use the word street art and how cool that is, and everyone's everyone finds it very acceptable. And but back then, no one was really, uh, no one really found it acceptable and no one found us acceptable in any way so but we loved it it was like this little subculture that i found with a collection of other students with other uh with other um fellow artists so uh sorry so we started uh, working on it together so this is just like a, a quick sort of insight into what we used to do i would call it like abstract topography what i mean by that is like it was a study of letter forms i used the letters uh, m-a-s-e-r stood for macer and in some way we um what I'd say is like uh, we'd skew the letters to what, manipulate them to what we want to want to do to express ourselves. <clears throat> and so, yeah, as I said, this photo was taken back in 2002, so that's quite a long time ago. So it's like me and a group of kids that found like an alliance amongst each other that we didn't really have with uh, with other people. And so I, I wasn't so much like driven to art. I was more so led to art through graffiti. So. I was like a 15 year old, um, not much to really do, a lot of this pent up energy, didn't really know how to expel it, wasn't too interested in following sports like football or soccer or stuff like that. And then I came across graffiti and i just seen it scribbled across the city and it just sparked an interest in me. And the more I learned about it, the more I discovered that it was something that I could um, express myself by doing. So I, I found a few other guys from Dublin, same thing, and it just became this real way of life for us. And so every single day we just met up, painted, sketched together, drank together, ate together, stayed in each other's houses, saved our money, lunch money, saved money for paint, rob paint, do whatever we needed to get to get paint and, and paint obsessively <coughs> um, for all of our teens. <coughs> so I mean like obsessively, I mean like obsessively like um, after school, on the weekends, at night, girlfriends are jealous because of my relationship with our, with our art and stuff like that. So I've, I found myself falling in love with art through having to find it in some, in some way, you know. So those sort of things. So I just said, there's <coughs> graffiti, there's no two ways about it. It was vandalism. There's an aspect of it that was vandalism. And we used to do that. And we used to paint trains, <coughs> go along the, what we have, <coughs> sorry, what we have is called a dart line at home and that's like your transit system and we go paint paint those trains paint on the walls and the reason for that was because more people could see your work and would travel around the city um so yeah we did that and i did it for years and years and years and i became probably the most active graffiti writer in ireland for a few years like painting hundreds of pieces a year i've painted thousands and thousands of pieces <coughs> um, i've just got a collection of work that i'll show you here but um and I can confidently say that like 99% of this is gone. Like there's no, um, there's nothing really left of it except a few photos. And we, even at that, we've lost a lot of it. So, um, so yeah, we were doing that and it was coming to the age of about like 18, 19, I started getting really good and I had this little artistic streak that I wanted to do. There's other kids that just enjoyed doing graffiti. I sort of found myself um, veering off into more, um, art oriented so, so I started drawing figurative work and stuff like that and portraits and and um <clears throat> became became yeah very successful at it and traveled the world and did all that and it was great but then like all good things I got caught you know and I got it was like good good few years ago and I got um I got I got caught by the police and a lot of us got caught and so we had to stop I, I got charged for graffiti and I got two years probation so I wasn't allowed to do anything but um, be a good boy. So, but that was actually good because I came across this thing called where it wasn't illegal to stick up stickers or do posters. So, <clears throat> at the time as well, I was saying, there's all these graffiti people. So, we're traveling the world. We're in Copenhagen quite a lot, and Slovenia, and Prague, and <clears throat> Berlin, painting trains and whatnot. And I think I was at that age, I was like 18, 19, where a lot of us uh, 
complain about our hometown. We're like, oh, I'm so sick of here. I want to move away. I'm going to move to Australia. Da, da. But the more I traveled, I had the opportunity to travel because of graffiti. The more I traveled, the more I actually realized how great home was and how great Dublin was. You know, it was a great capital of a neutral country. It was, it was just a, a beautiful place. So I wrote this little token of appreciation saying, Mates, still loves you. And I just started sticking these stickers around the city. The more I did that, um, it just developed onto little narratives that I started writing. And um, I was using paper and paste and drawing them in the house and just little little stories that I'd, I'd see happening around the city, like the Heartbreak Hotel, with these, uh, uh, what you call, we call them council flats. What would they be called there? Like, yeah, projects. That's behind my studio there. And um, so I was just looking at different things that were happening and Urban Achiever was like, a lot of the homeless are considered as underachievers. And so I was just playing with words like that and Lonely Hearts Club and Urban Lovers. and. Um, and I sort of extended that narrative then across the world. I started traveling more than, this is one example, every country that I went to that I enjoyed, I'd write the name with a heart logo in it. It was simple as that, like there wasn't really much agenda in it. I was, I was just sort of do the actions and then after sort of realized why, why you did it, like and, and its intentions. But, um, so that led on to then, with that sort of, so I went from that sort of abstract typography graffiti into more rounded type, as you saw, because I saw that like I could communicate to a wider audience. When we were doing graffiti, it was all for our own subculture and just communicating to one another and impressing each other and showing how we, our skill sets. So not, I realized that I was in the public realm, so I could communicate to the public. And so I started doing those pieces. And then in 2009, and yeah, 2009, I came up with this idea of like, what if I um, do these murals around the city? Um, what I'd actually done was, I was listening to this musician called Damien Dempsey, who Paul had just mentioned, and he's an Irish folk singer. Um, I'd consider him better than you too, but like, uh, he's very, very local and just true to, he would represent a, a, the voice of like a lot of young people like me from Dublin. So his music had a great positive effect on me and I want to share that. And that's, I think, a narrative with a lot of my work. I want to share, share experiences and communicate experiences. So I got in contact with him and I said, can you let me use your words and I'll transcribe them onto the walls. And that was pretty much it. You know, I met, met with him in a pub where you meet pretty much anybody for a meeting in Ireland. You meet him in a pub and have a pint. And uh, so I met with him and I said that. I said, look, I just want to share your message. So he did. So he said, yeah, cool, started giving me loads of content. And so I started transcribing these pieces around the city of Dublin. And aesthetically, I chose um, sign writing, the style of sign writing, because um, it was like a lost art form in Ireland. It was like, it was how a lot of the identities of towns would, well, I feel, and I'm pretty sure it's true, it's like how a city will be, its visual identity is based on a lot of its sign writing. And in those cities or towns, they usually had a local sign writer. And for Dublin, the most prominent guy that I knew of was Kevin Freeney. And he was quite famous for going around his bike and painting all the signs. He painted towns. He, 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 it's rumor has it that he painted a sign nearly every street in Dublin, like within the city center. So I looked at him as an influence and just um, did that in a more contemporary fashion. So. We're addressing some of the lyrics that Damien said. He gave me new word, gave me some new poems and whatnot, and I just transcribed them around the city. Any sort of location I could find. We did end up doing 23 locations in total. During that journey of doing it and being in the outdoors, I found myself um, getting to know a lot of the homeless in Dublin. And because I was spending a lot of time in the street in the city centre painting, um, I just started hanging out with those homeless people because they were hanging out there too. So, you know, I realized that like, we look at the city and probably same here, like you're gonna leave here, go from A to B, which would be home or to a friend's house or to a restaurant. And the streets is just this transient space. But for me, it was my um, studio. And for these guys, it was, it was their home. So I built a really, really, really good relationship with a lot of homeless in Dublin. And um, there was, um, a lot of, I learned a lot from them, and one guy in particular called Kevin, and he was, just to give you a insight into the story, was he was a um, successful job. He was a head butcher in a big grocery store. Um, his brother was the manager of it. His brother died tragically. Kevin couldn't handle it. Lost his job, because I lost his house, then ended up homeless, then, ended up in prison because he committed a crime. When he was in prison, he ended up on heroin, 
and then I met him back on the street, and then so he was a homeless heroin addict. And uh, he was a beautiful guy, and I got, I got to know him really well, hung out with him for the day. But that sparked an interest then. I was like, okay, that's a really interesting story. Now I need to go to prison. I want to learn more about that. So I dug my f heels in, I got to know a few people, and um, I got into Mountjoy Prison. It's the biggest prison in, um, in Dublin, in Ireland, and then St. Um, St. Patrick's for young offenders. And so I went in there and I did murals with the, in the same project with Damon Dempsey and I, I painted murals with those kids and with the inmates um, for a month. I spent a whole month in there actually. It was pretty, I wanted to stay in there but they wouldn't let me um, because they're short in beds anyway. Um, but so yeah, I was just doing, this is in the solitary confinement. This is so, this is under 21s and they're locked up for 23 hours a day. And um, there was a young kid there that was, was from Limerick and I was working with him and he helped me paint. And he was, he had been conditioned to think that that was fine to stay there. And he was like, you know, this is my life. This, and I was like, what the fuck, are, you mad, are you mad, man? Like, you know, even I was like, girls and drink and da 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 da, all the things of a young boy and exploring the city. He just dismissed them all. So I made sure to paint that mural with him to sort of hopefully um, break that mold a little bit. But, had, um, so we did that, and that was sort of towards the end of it. This project went on for like a year, about a year and a half. And um, I had all this content then. I didn't really know what to do with it. So I had 23 murals in the city. I had a photographer who was photographing it all. And then by this stage, I started building momentum. It was like on the radio, I was like, what are all these murals? That so then I, I, I thought, well, why don't we give money back to the homeless? And so I met with the head charity there, Dublin Simon Community, and I said, we're going to have an exhibition of all these works, and I'll do original works as well. And how can we, um, what can we do? And they're like, yeah, we need money. And I was like, well, I'm a tangible person. I don't just give you money. It just goes into admin. So what is it that you need? And I said, we need a medical van. So like, how much does that cost? And they're like, 30,000 euro, which is probably about $40,000. And uh, so that was the goal. We raised that with, with the exhibition by just everyone coming together and selling the works we made in the weekend. And that was a real, like, what I'm talking about, like the engagement with the public, that was like an extension that, again, I could see the, my work engaging with the public and everyone taking ownership of it and making, we all had this common goal, you know, and that was only in hindsight, looking back, it's like, oh my God, that's, that's really interesting. That's gonna be, I'm gonna, I wanna do more of that, it made me feel good. So um, this is like, a, the, we ended up painting, this is, um, in the Ballymone Flats, these are all knocked down. These are the projects, like probably the toughest projects in Ireland. And um, so I got to paint a mural at the end. So I actually have a video just to show you the process because it's sometimes of interest.
So the reason we chose those words is because Damien Dempsey, the musician, his family actually um, were from Ballymona, from those, from those tower blocks. And when he was born, they actually moved out. But those, those blocks were then knocked down a month later, so we came up with those lyrics to sort of suit the space. So um, yeah, so that, 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 that work continued on pretty much. Like a lot of this type-based work, as I said, was like a continuation from the abstract stuff. I had, at this, at this stage of doing the typography, I went to college then. Um, I went and studied fine art first, and then I moved on to um, visual communications. And in that course, I really fell in love with typography, the use of letter forms, because it really lent itself to what I was already doing. And so I amalgamated my graffiti life and this graphic design, and then I started producing work like this. Um, and these are just simple messages that I started writing myself around the city, little notes that I'd taken, and my little cousin had passed away tragically, and I just wrote a little note to myself, and then thought maybe I'll share that, and I got a wall and painted it. Um, another one where I actually met you guys, <laughs> Paul and Russell one day in Dublin, um, I was painting this, you know, just simple, simple messages that I wanted to do because um, I didn't want any fuss over it either because the uh, city's so busy and you're going back and forth that I, want, I know you have this very short opportunity, window of opportunity to uh, say something to someone. So I kept a very simple two colours, um, sans serif typeface. It's just really bold and um, bright. Um, another one that these are the words of Shane Massini. Um, so yeah, I just painted them around the city. So, but what happened was. Um, I then, those were in Dublin, I started extending a bit further and going around, going around the world and I'm, I'm, I came across this um, spoken words poet called uh, Malcolm London and he was only 21. He's from Chicago and he's really interesting. We ended up uh, get, getting in contact over emails and I was passing through Chicago on a trip on a layover and I stayed there then. And um, so we made this little home video ourselves and it's the same thing, it's like I took some of his lyrics, painted them on the wall and then he did his poem over it. So it's very homemade the video, but still I think it, his words are beautiful. There is one thing the richest man can never purchase, yesterday. It feels like yesterday I sat Indian style around my grandfather's armchair, suspended above my head like a skyline. His belly beneath denim overalls, reeking of old spice and drinking Mississippi cotton gin, he would say, before nodding off to the will of fortune and waking up when someone turned the station, if you are early, you are on time. If you are on time, you are late but it is never too late for your time. The richest man could never purchase yesterday. Yesterday, my grandma says she sees everything on the block. She complained about friends my cousin brings into the house off the street late at night to use her bathroom. She fuss always, but always let folk use her bathroom. The richest man could never purchase yesterday, but could purchase a new bathroom. Every morning, my granddad, a construction worker with massive forearms, building up a city, tearing down his pension, unfurls his bones at 6 a.m. to read the Bible in his pickup truck. I've never seen him go to church, but make a chapel out of the garage. He was never fully awake until my grandma handed him his thermos of coffee. The richest man could never purchase yesterday, but could purchase a lot of coffee. I am a poor man living in the same neighborhood my grandparents could never afford to leave. Every morning I read headlines, 18 shot in a weekend, 300 dead in a summer, 50 schools shut down, public funding cut trying to turn poems into eulogies I find in the newspaper. Every day I teach students their words will footprint into new front page stories. 
The richest man could never purchase yesterday, but could purchase a news station. My grandmother is a woman carrying a house on her back. Show to more people who walk in without wiping their feet on the mat. My grandfather of a clock ran out of time before he was ever late. My grandmother's favorite pastime is dreaming of my grandpa's past. Every day I sit in a classroom, pointing to the granddaddy armchair lining in the sky, telling my students, this city is yours. This is your house, with all its late night back alley bathroom visits under all this construction, you are builders. Hold your dreams like a lover's hand. Hand the next person you see a thermos of coffee. Wake them up, wake them up. No headline defines you. No amount of money can take away your yesterday. So pick up truck where you left off and keep going. No hands control your time except yours. It is never too late to wake up for your will of fortune. No matter who controls the station, wake up, wake up. It is never too late to love like my grandma taught me. Never too late to love yourself enough to purchase a new beginning. So, uh, yeah, that was a great experience to do that with Malcolm because there was um, this common bond between us, even though, like, as a white guy from Dublin, Ireland, and he's a black kid from Chicago, there was still this um, similarities between us, you know, through different lifestyles, but still the same common goals. And it was just really interesting that both our disciplines brought us together. Like, so we're still good friends and we'll collaborate again for sure on something else. Um, so what I realized was that like, <clears throat> coming from the graffiti background and street art background was, um, was that like, and then I developed into using typography was that I was actually using typography as a crutch for ages because I wasn't really getting fulfillment out of it. I was it got to stage where I wasn't getting fulfillment out of it. I was just um, I had a lot more to sort of say and I think it was actually looking back, it was actually based on fear. I was really afraid of becoming an artist, you know, and uh, because I'm from Dublin City and you just don't do that. You know, it's just not cool. Um, you wouldn't go into a bar and tell me you're an artist, you get laughed out of it. Um, so um, so I was fearful of that, and then I just said, no, fuck that, I accept that, and this is what I want to do. And so I started looking at that. So, as I said earlier, with that live and love piece, I met the guys. At, at that time, I really noticed that this effect my work was having on the city, and how in some way it was interrupting the landscape. That one day, people are there going to work normal, and the next day it's like, boom, it's this huge, big statement. And so I looked at that, investigated that, and I sort of started bringing that into the work. So. As well as the work that you've seen, there was a lot of graphic design work that I was doing and painting canvases that were quite, had a lot of uh, linear lines in it and optical, optical sort of op art influences. And um, so I started bringing that then into my bigger works. So this, I was just looking at that interrupting the landscape and this is pretty much just uh, duct tape and fish gut in a forest and just um, taped it up and put it up and photographed it really well. and. It turned out great. And so that just sort of developed onto more ideas then where I got found these, I was in a florist one day and I found this, um, in my studio next door, a, a lady Pam next door, she had um, this, this fluorescent ribbon. I was like tying a bouquet with it. I was like, it's amazing, what's that? Ordered some of it. And I always had it in my suitcase and I went to the Louvre to go check it out. Go see the Mona Lisa. And I, um, I, I, I pulled up this, um, just two trees on either side and pulled it up and then photographed it. And that was the idea of like interrupting this landscape again, like, you know, with a beautiful backdrop. Um, so th- they were quite playful and stuff like that. Um, developed onto then doing some woodwork and building some bigger pieces because I always like, um, I always thought I was actually going to be a lumberjack when I was a kid. So um, I, uh, so in some way, I was sort of fulfilling that with these pieces. I saw, I'll show you some more work now. I do a lot of woodwork. So I, I looked at this as like, how can I really interrupt this landscape? So I built this, this um, cube and I put it in the middle of the road. And then we just filmed cars driving and stopping, having to reverse or trying to dictate like how they're going to get around the thing. And I, I, thought, I found that very interesting. Um, same thing then, I was, I was like looking at old disused places and giving them new 
new life. Um, this is in Limerick. It's an, an old cholera hospital, and uh, it's been disused for years. And I just, you know, it's no one even notices. And then once you put a bit of paint on it, um, it takes on a life of its own. So, uh, you know, I thought I was quite confident to do that. Just do a monochrome, black and white, um, a chevron, and then just see see how that works with the space with that canvas and. Uh, uh, it helped. Uh, it worked quite well. So then that that moved on to then I found this. Uh, it's down the same town, Limerick. It's in the west of Ireland. Uh, this disused gas station, and um, Limerick City of Culture wanted me to come down and hide this eyesore they call it. So to the right there was um, fencing. So they're going to put up boards along that, and then I would paint a nice mural and blah blah blah. blah. Um, but I looked at that as an interesting canvas. So we, we, this is in December in Ireland, so it rains 24/7. Uh, so we spent most of our time just cleaning it and, and clogging the drains and whatnot. But then we, we painted it anyway. And we got it some vehicles and we put them inside and we painted it. Um, and this is a real turning point at the time because um, it's, when I painted it, I was like just decorating this disused space and I was like, cool. But then when I was photographing it, people came into it to look at it. And I was like, at that moment, I was like, I've just created an experiential painting. This is amazing, an interactive painting, deadly. And so I kept at that idea a bit more and developed on. I'm using this as an example. This is actually a piece that I created with Tandem Press when I was first with the guys. But I, I, I looked at like paintings and stuff like that I was doing like this. I was like, what if I elevate these paintings and make them experiential, three-dimensional, that people can then walk through? So I did that. I, said, I went to Berlin then, I got invited to a show, and I said, I have this crazy idea. I don't want to do paintings, I want to build a painting. And they were totally cool with it. And um, so I built these big labyrinth pieces. So not only am I interrupting the landscape and interrupting people, now I'm actually like narrating people through the painting as well. So, uh, you know, this is all just idea, make it, idea, make it. And then look back and go, oh yeah, that was, this is all just one big common thread, like, you know, so. It was very exciting to do it and I really enjoyed it. Got to do woodwork and, you know, just a little bit more construction. I had to get builders involved in it as well. Um, then, um, so I would consider myself a painter, but like also, I think our generation now is definitely, I think it was, I think we're more um, um, integrated, you know, like we definitely have an integrated lifestyle. Like, you know, there's a lot of, graphic designers who become artists or skaters who are now graphic designers and musicians. So I've, I've lent my hand to, I'm a painter, but I also do woodwork and now I do some videos. So I make, I make installations and then I do some fun videos as well. So this is just a, an example of that. Yeah, it's like a lot of those projects are fun. That was in Berlin and I'd flown from somewhere else and we had like five days to do it and I had this idea of like making the mundane a bit. I, I think we actually watched it, so like some of the ideas are so silly. Uh, I think we watched a Disney movie on the plane and then I was like, I thought of Disneyland and this hyper reality, you know, how like it's this silly reality and I was like, oh, why don't we make something like that? Like take this mundane, scenario, the kitchen, the living room that we're so used to make it this hyper reality. And uh, so that was, that's as, as in depth as that <laughs> concept was at the time, but uh, I think it worked. And so, yeah, th this is then like, you know, we have people in the spaces and then I would create somewhere, we make clothing for them. And it's just an extension of that idea that like, they really become a part of the art and become these playgrounds really. So 
was a piece I made and then I traveled around Germany um, to a few different locations. It even popped up in locations I didn't even know was was going to be in. It just got, um, I got tagged on it in photos and Instagram. Um, with the piece I showed in Limerick, this disused space, it was, I got this opportunity, I got an email. It's usually how all this stuff comes true. And they were like, hey, do you want to come paint a motel in downtown Vegas? I was like, no problem. Um, <laughs> so uh, we did that, like, you know, it was just this disused space. And um, I just put in some of these photos to show you, like a lot of these big projects as well, I can't do them on my own. So it becomes um, this, um, di like, this big collab collaborative process. So the sort of overall team that I've noticed that's in my work is like relationships. And so it was like me impacting the city, and then my relationship with the public, and then them, uh, now they're interacting with the work and that relationship. And now I also need to bring people involved and I need their help to make those pieces. And then when they do it, it's usually volunteers. Um, they take ownership of it too. So it becomes like this, all these different stages to just one piece. So the final piece is just one aspect of it. You know, the final photo I have is this whole sort of thread of um, stuff. So th this, is, this is here, like would, would there be a crew of us here, volunteers painting, and then I'll go mark out what needs to be colored in, and this will be the final result. And, you know, this is in Vegas, like so, and I'm Irish, and, and so it was pretty tough in terms of the heat. We just got blasted out of it. but. Uh, it was well worth it, like it was really enjoyable and it was a turf where you could walk through and stuff. So I stayed up for two years and then just the, the weather there just destroyed it after a while. A lot of those pieces are sort of semi-permanent as well. Um, I'll put in a few different slides to show you what I was saying before, like that um, I'm a painter, but then we'd sort of lend a hand to anything. I think if someone was to ridicule um, a person for the process, so let's say someone uses a projector because they want to, sketch up onto a canvas and they can't draw and someone ridiculed them saying that's not a real artist i think that's really bad because you're being creative in your process so i'll commend anybody use whatever you can use whatever tool you got to use to communicate what you need to communicate and so with this i got commissioned to do different works and for this it was actually i used light photography and um, i got commissioned by u2 to do a music video for them and uh, so I did a um, stop motion animation where actually I, I found this, um, it was like a light stick, a pixel stick, where I could input art into it. And then when you open the shutter, you move the pixel stick, shutter closes and it reveals this artwork. So, but for every second, as Russell knows, it's like what, 25 frames. So we had to make like a four minute video. So it took me like two weeks, two nights of doing like walking through the city, back and forth to get just one, one shot. But, um, yeah, so we just played at the city, and the, the video was actually I'm delayed to show the video. You have to buy it on iTunes, um, and I haven't even bought it, so it's okay. Uh, so um, the 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 artwork was just traveling through the city, and um, uh, I went out to the song is called Cedarwood Road, and that's where Bono lived, and it's not too far from my house. And so the the artwork was just playing was just playing through the city where he grew up and where he played and my my playgrounds too for painting so for that so it's just jumping through the city it's quite playful and it works really well um different then different uh materials that i said about before where i was using ribbon to those insertions i then one day noticed that that ribbon was uv sensitive and so you put on a black light it, ch it turns into this so i started making these labyrinths out of ribbon um in different spaces uh, across Germany. And uh, I found myself in Germany loads because they're just really good to work with, like they're so sufficient. So, uh, and that's the truth. So like I'll get there and everything will be lined up and we could just do it. And a lot of the projects, like you do one project and then some other curator will see it and from some other gallery or someone else and then they'll ask you to do something. So there was a summer too where I found myself in uh, Europe quite a lot. And uh, these are great, you know, like there's no Photoshop or anything, it just works really well and they became um, really good, playful spaces as well for people, like we're, we're living in like a selfie um, era and so these became great backdrops and stuff like that for people to get their photo taken in front of and, and you know, I'm very aware of social media and its importance and sharing your message, so I, I really, I condone it, like I, I think some artists don't like it. I, I, I like the idea of people sharing it and hashtagging it and 
because you know you can a simple example we all know Banksy but who's seen a Banksy piece you know I have but um, no but like who's actually seen it but we all know because of social media and the internet so I, I fully I uh, believe in the relationship between technology and art I think it's quite important um, other pieces then I would because I'd coming from the graphic design background I would be able to do graphics and get them printed on on different mediums. So rather than paint this, I got the opportunity to just bus and I travel around Dublin City and they asked, I travel around Ireland actually, and um, it was a part of the Irish Design Awards. They picked me and Orla Kiley, or Keeley, um, can't pronounce the second name, um, but they asked, would I, would I celebrate Irish design by creating artwork and be on a bus? And I was like, yeah, it'd be great because then your artwork gets to travel around the city and people get to see it. So I said, why not? So. That's still on the city, and uh, I get added again on social media quite a lot. I got added actually a while ago where the bus is broken down in the motorway, and everyone had to stand out in the street. <laughs> um, and then I do other stuff like, because uh, you know, painting is quite laborious and it's tough work, and you're out, outdoors all the time. And so, so I, I do a gra graphic design work as well when I can. And uh, they re-released James Joyce's novel, uh, Portrait of the Artist. Um, so that was good to do too, you know, I just do different projects like that. I do, I just created this, that musician, Damien Dempsey, that I spoke about. Um, he released a new album and he asked what I do the artwork for it. So, you know, these sort of things are good. These are like hobbies for me. I'm doing them on an airplane or I'm lying in bed. I'm not like sitting there in the studio taking notes. I'm just having fun with them. So, uh, yeah, that's the front and that's the back. It's pretty self-explanatory, soul, sun. And I was just looking at um, sunsets and I was taking loads of photos and silhouettes and whatnot. And then I was like, I'll oh, just strip it right back and just look at that gradient that you see in the sky that no one can ever paint or ever replicate, but we always try to do it. Um, and so I just used that and then that was it. I thought, it was, I thought it was quite confident to just use the negative space and just leave it very blank in the middle. And then nighttime at the back. Um, I do commercial work occasionally as well. Um, I'm, I, I'm scared of it sometimes <laughs> because of like working with brands and whatnot. But sometimes you have good relationships, and sometimes it's not bad. So I don't, um, I, I don't uh, discredit anyone who does commercial work. I just always be very wary of it myself. But you got to pay your bills like everyone else. So, Dad, Brown Thomas is like the most established store in Ireland and um, they asked me to do the windows. And this is on the main shopping street in Dublin, uh, Ireland. So it, it's a, like a real nostalgic thing for a lot of Irish people because as a kid, I, I used to go into town at, at Christmas and everyone would come and they'd look at the new Christmas windows with their parents. It was like a thing, you'd have a lunch in town and look at these decorative windows. So they asked me to do the windows, not Christmas ones, but so I looked at it going, okay, that'd be cool to do and I'd get to bring my mum in and show her the windows. So, um, this is a video of us just putting together and it's not painting, it's using graphics, some wood work and getting a team of people to come in, but it's just wanted to show you how art can lend itself quite well to the commercial world and still keep your integrity to a degree. So yeah, these are um, more of 
sort of installation work. I ended up living in the States for two years. Um, I moved back. To, I moved back two years ago. So before that, I was for two years living in Arkansas, north northwest Arkansas, in a town called Fayetteville, and uh, I loved it. It was great. It was, um, I think I needed a break from like busy Dublin, and um, ended up sparking up a really good relationship with this guy called Steve Clark, and um, ended up going visiting for two months. Fell in love with Arkansas, strangely, and uh, moved there. <laughs> and um, and so this is one of the pieces I created at the Walton Art Center. Um, so I'm with the Waltons who also own Crystal Bridges and stuff like that. So they um, invited me to do a piece for them. And so it was great to do it. And this is always a great way of knowing if a piece of art works, if like kids come on board, like if, they, if they're there, if they engage with it, you know, it's good. If they don't, you know, it's bad. Um, or it's not doing its job. Like we're too proud at our age to jump around on something like that. But so um, this kid, I thought that photo was really funny. It's like he was changing into his costume behind the, behind the scenes. Um, Paula mentioned earlier about me going to Sydney. I was lucky enough to get a job opportunity to go a few years ago to do um, an installation in Hi Hyde Park, and it's uh, their Central Park, and um, you know other artists that were commissioned before, like Jeff Coons and whatnot, like that sort of caliber. So it's pretty. I was pretty confused to why they asked me, but I didn't question it. I just went with it. And um, so I put in this plan because I want to sort of show you how, how things are made. So we had to do this big piece and we weren't able to build it on site. We had to build it off site and then reconstruct it somewhere else. And so I was scratching my head for ages. And then I thought of um, building it really modular out of 40 foot containers that are on backs of, backs of trucks. If they become the framework, then I can dress them and then just build them together. So that's sort of like, a PDF of the plan, a loose plan of how it's done. And then, so we, we build it, we assemble it all together in a warehouse, start painting it, and then deassemble it, and then bring it into Hyde Park. Um, so yeah, you can see there, like the, the, the exposed pack of the back of the container. Um, so it became um, quite modular and then came together as this huge, huge piece. And it was very, um, obnoxious and robust and beautiful and everything <laughs> everything in one like but it was uh it was like mc escher influenced a little bit like you know the stairs and the optical sort of what's up or down but i had to be very practical and um it was so arty until they put in the banisters and then when the banisters went in it became such a practical space but i really loved that because then i sort of questioned the idea of it being an art piece or is it a practical piece and then loads of different people can enjoy it in different in different in different ways so it's nice that like you know you see a kid going in and looking as like an exploration and then you might have an art critic saying this is absolute rubbish this is an art and then you'll have like other people in there just enjoying it for what it is and so I, I like that I like that conversation I like that um questioning and stuff like I think it's of interest to me anyway uh, while I was there as well the the mayor of Sydney commissioned me to do um, the piece for the Sydney Opera House and that was um, at the New Year's Eve party and that became the sort of stage and the firework display, the famous fire, firework display they have so I got to go to the party and all I had to do was create some artwork, it was pretty cool. Um, so it was cool, you know, that was quite temporary, that was only two pieces and we took some components of the bigger bigger installation because it's still been constructed and then brought them into that and set it up. So. It was quite, it was pretty straightforward. Um, as Paula said earlier, I was got invited to Palais de Tokyo as well. Um, it's a bit like the, this is a bit like the, um, um, the Disneyland piece. I was just like two weeks before that, I was really pushed for time and I was like, what can I do? Even though like I know the, the narrative of the work and it's the engagement and, uh, people taking ownership of the space and my relationship with them, but I, I also need like a, a theme to sort of change pieces up and literally yeah two weeks before that I was in Greece and I swam into a cave and at the end was like a, a rock pool and so I just illustrated that in my own style. I want to share I, it's such a memorable experience of it. I loved it that I then re recreated that in um, in Paris um, This is what Dublin people look like these are the, my builders. Um, I always have a laugh. Uh, so we I got commissioned to do a piece in Dublin city centre. 
and this is my first installation uh, in Dublin. It's only a few years ago because I keep getting asked to do it across the world and it was a bit strange. I was never doing them at home, so I finally got invited to do one. And um, this was it, and it was, so I actually took a little bit of a dig at Dublin <laughs> when I did this, not intentionally, but there's a housing crisis going on, and rent uh, is extortionate, and landlords are ripping people off and putting them in, like, six people in a two-bedroom house and whatnot. So I had this, like, idea of, like, b building this utopia piece, and uh, from the outside it looks so beautiful. A bit like the Wizard of Oz, that's, I actually never told them that, but that was the actual, um, underlying team, you know, just beautiful. But then behind the veil, it's just this old cranky guy pulling things. So that's what I wanted to create, this beautiful, aesthetic, amazing place. But then when you went inside, it was just completely dysfunctional space um, where I put music and fog and just really uncomfortable. You know, the juxtaposition between the two is what interested me. So, um, but that was great, you know, I loved, I loved creating a piece in Dublin as well. So it wasn't all bad. Um, then also, I, I would I'd get invited to different things, like um, this is for the Web Summit, and uh, I got commissioned to do a, a stage design for them. And it's something I've never done before, but I'd look at like a lot of masters or artists that I've looked up to and I've seen that they lent their hand to doing set design and stages, so I said, why not, like, if I'll give it a go. So um, it was quite simple, I, uh, I just looked at the idea of data going through the space, uh, going through the space, I wanted to, um, not the stage just to be there, but the stage to engulf the room as well, so take over the space, so um, it's quite enjoyable to do that, to do it and see how set set is built and hand it over to a team of professionals and you just get to sit around and relax and watch them do it, so. Um, then, you know, I, I, I think I want to be an architect in time, but like this is not a good example of it. This is my first one, um, but I got commissioned to do a temporary build house. They wanted a, it was for a festival in Ireland, and they wanted um, me to do an installation. And so I was trying to think like it was an Irish festival, so I was like, what 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 are the most important things you want at a festival? I was like to stay dry, music and booze. And so I, I could create like a house party. So I, I wanted to design a house. So I designed a house to where you could stay dry, have booze, and there'd be DJs. So that's what we did. We, I, I, I made this and got these builders in. We literally built a house, like a three-story house, um, that only stayed up for two days. And then we just took it all apart again. Um, but that was it from the outside and stuff. And we went inside then. And you know, still that extension of like this, like the hyper-reality, mundane, environments and making a, a new experience of it like so it's making bedrooms and there's there's a lot more to this space there's interactive components too as well you get your photo taken um this is just another installation that i have that i did in montreal two years ago um i got invited to go to montreal like if if i get if i get an invite and it's a place i've never been it's of interest and you let me do an installation you're more than likely going to get a yeah um, if I've been there before, you might. But like, so Montreal is somewhere I want to go because it's a really young, progressive city, um, oozing with young talents like musicians and visual artists. And it becomes like, I know it because I know so many artists from there, it becomes like a stepping stone and then they go on to build a career. So I really want to go visit there. So they had a metro station and they asked me would I transform it into an installation as part of um, an art festival that was that was on. So there's a, other artists. A lot of the work that I do as well, it won't be just me. It'll be like two or three other artists. It'll be part of like a mural festival or an art installation art festival or, you know, just like a group exhibition. So I wasn't the only one at that. Um, I'll bring some of the art installations inside. This is a, um, a temporary piece for Monica Art Fair last year in London. Um, I would still try to do when I can uh, get back to just painting buildings um, because I find them quite interesting to interrupt that landscape again, as I said, and this is in London. I just moved to London at the time and it was in E17 and um, they asked would I paint the space and I thought it was a really interesting canvas to do, so I said why not and it's still there now, you know, so uh, it's, it's a, like, it's accepted a lot, like there's, London's pretty funny, people say what they, what they think, you know, and a lot of people are 
give me shit and a lot of people are loving it. Like someone was just hated the color pink for some reason. She had to profess it to me so much, like, you know. And I told her I hate her hat, so it's fine. Um, <laughs> so this is then another, another sort of piece. Like with this, you're really taking over. You're like wallpapering this, the, the, the building. You're taking ownership of it. You're making an art installation. But then this becomes more practical because it becomes sort of decorative and you're like, questioning is this still art or am I just decorating this building or whatnot but I, as I said before I sort of like questioning that idea and it is public art and I'm investing into my city and I'm making it look better as much as Dublin City Council might think otherwise I think everything that we're doing is for good for the good of our city so this is just a dirty old building beforehand you know until we came and painted it. Um, I collaborate quite a lot as much as I can with uh, other artists. It's quite hard sometimes because it's like any relationship, you've got to get on with that person and you're sharing the space with them. And, um, and so you have to have a mutual respect. So Connor Harrington is a really, really well-established Irish artist. He lives in London and we painted this mural in Arkansas. And it was just a really good opportunity for two different styles to come together. And they're so contrasting, but I think they really complemented each other. And um, it was great that two Irish artists were in Arkansas painting a mural of all places. So, uh, yeah, it was great. Um, another artist then, this is a guy called um, Insa, and he does graffiti. So he makes gifts out of artwork. So he'll work with an artist just to animate the artwork. So whatever your artwork is, he'll then paint it with you. So you have to, for, to produce this mural, you have to paint it four times. And you have to paint it in, in increments. And then when you take those four photos, you put them together and it, the composition is this, it makes the artwork come alive. And this is very basic compared to what he does, but uh, I vowed never to do it again. Like it was just so tedious. It took us like four days just to paint that, you know. Um, this is me in the studio then. I do some canvas work and uh, I have the occasional exhibition. Um, I find myself not doing it so much. I, I enjoy it, but I don't really have the patience, to be honest. Like. Um, I'll, I'll sit in the studio and just sort of like scratch my head loads and smoke loads of cigarettes and go home with nothing done. And then I'll get a burst of it. But I, I think I, it's, you have to rewire your brain a little bit because you're outside and you're painting these huge murals and these huge big projects and you're project managing everything and everything has to be done before. And then you have to go sit in this quiet studio and you're left with your thoughts and sometimes that's terrifying, you know. Um, but it just I've learned that it just takes a while to sort of recondition your mindset and uh, so I do enjoy it. I had an exhibition last year in London. Um, I had two shows last year, a print show and a, a painting show and these are some of those paintings like very very loose stuff and the idea is about like bringing people, integrating them into the artwork really like what I was saying about having people um, walk through the artworks then I'm just trying to develop the, developed that idea onto 2D and so I'd photograph models, abstract their forms and put them in with that sort of linear hardline work that I was doing and see how that relationship works between the two. Um, so that's just a few different paintings from different pieces. Um, then using sort of uh, reduction painting, re removing certain components to reveal other pieces underneath. Um, then introduce some woodwork as well, mix with paint some relief work that I just enjoy, like more hands-on pieces rather than delicate pieces. Um, then, as well as that, I do some print work. Actually, I've been doing a lot of fine art printmaking since with Tandem and same in Ireland. And this is with Tandem Press when I was first with them. And it was a really memorable, great experience because I sort of walked in not knowing what I was doing. And they were very patient and sort of intimidatingly just all stood there looking at me, waiting for me to tell them what, what to do. And I didn't know what to do. So um, I just started doodling and we, we started making some work. So um, it's been really, really super to work with the guys. And uh, here are some of the large woodblock prints that we made a few years ago. These are about four or five foot high. And um, it was just Real, real good learning for me, like, and see the process of how it is and how disciplined the guys are. And, um, yeah, you know, they're masters at their crafts and they're able to execute any sort of idea you have. So it was really enjoyable for me to sit back and just see it come together and be produced so, so well. So this was last year I was with them and we made these pieces too. 
And I put these in because then I took the one on the left and then brought it, I ended up going to uh, DC and got to paint a mural, so I just painted that print. So it was nice sort of to do that crossover. I think I'm gonna do that a lot more. Um, I'd, I think the print actually looks better in the mural. So good work, tandem. Um, I was talking about the relationships as well before with a lot of the work and with people and I started looking at our relationships with other stuff and I found myself like drawing loads of plants recently and I think it's probably because I'm living in London, I'm in a congested city and there's not much around except concrete and, if, and I just was drawn towards drawing plants. And when I was back in Dublin I went to um, the Botanical Gardens and I started drawing lots of plants there. I'd probably just like it's a simple fix to get to nature in some way. Um, and the more I investigated, I found out that there was actually real good attributes to a lot of plants, you know, for like, I have a lot of issues with sleeping and anxiety and other things um, that I'm sure a lot of other people here in the room suffer with too. Um, and I started discovering that like aloe vera or whatever other plants can alleviate that like and can help you sleep better and whatnot so that I looked at that relationship too so that's where I am with that I've only started in the last few months and I introduced it into my artwork so that's what we're doing now and this is a piece where I'm I called people and plants and it's body forms with plants and my hardline work and um, that's in uh, Virginia Beach um, on the Museum of Contemporary Art there and there's three parts of that project there was this mural a stage design and then a large installation. Um, like most city planners, like they just break your balls about doing stuff, so stuff got delayed, so we couldn't, they're only finishing the stage now and then they're gonna start doing the installation next week, something like that. So it's just when, when you're doing these large public works, there's always delays where some, so, someone's stopping or there wasn't permission for something or some city planner says blah, 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 blah. But we got the mural done anyway, which was great. And th those guys are amazing to work with. Um, I was just in Israel last week or 10 days ago and this is in a city called Haifa and it's actually the largest mural in the city. I didn't realize that we were halfway through it. They said it was the largest one there. So it's still a continuation of what I was doing. I had to simplify this a little bit because I painted that in three days um, and it was like 35 degrees heat. I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit, but 90 something degrees and that's a lot for me. Um, so, but we got it done and another great experience um, and that's brought me on to where we are sort of now like with these are just I'm back in tandem working with the guys and we started yesterday um, continuing that idea of plants and um, we're going to do collage prints and um, so to do that I, I just started making collages so we went and got some colour paper and started cutting them up and stick them together so you can see the process there it's usually I'll doodle on paper, then I'll be working on the laptop, and then I'll bring it back onto paper again. Um, and then, then we'll have a discussion, um, just me and Paula. This is pretty much how our days look like, me trying to work and Paula shouting at me. <laughs> <I know. laughs> no, but, um, so yeah, this, this will be it then. There's a discussion had between the process and the guys are the pros. And I sort of, as you can see, take a back step on that and let them sort of Figure figure that out, and that's something that I really, uh, I really try. To, I, try I try not to be. I'm precious, but I'm not too precious. Like let those guys do it, do do. And that's something that sort of, I've I've um, become to accept in my work. It's like let other people take it and go with it, and they'll have fresh eyes and they'll bring something new to that you haven't done. And uh, so I'll leave you with these two projects, and it's based on that idea. It's like uh, a friend of mine, Mark. He's up there on the roof. Um, he's a teacher and he has summer holidays every year for three months off and he surfs and he goes to Africa quite a lot and uh, he hit me up one time, he's in Liberia surfing, he's like if you could send me artwork to the spec of this space I can get the locals to paint it so you just hand over this work and I was like oh I'm a bit hesitant to that um, but I'll give it a go and so we did it and then um, I sent him this artwork and he was there surfing and we got paint together and got the locals to do it and they, they painted this makeshift basketball court, this whole building, you know, and uh, it became really, really interesting because it became the first sort of piece that I'd never painted and I didn't even need to be there. And um, 
And so then it, it led us on to, you know, he came back from Liberia and I was like, oh, that was amazing. We met for a drink, we met for a pint. And we're like, what we do next? And um, we had both sort of um, spoke about Uganda and what's going on there with um, Set Sudan above with the civil war. And we, were, we came aware of it because of in the media, this, um, this, uh, it's actually the largest refugee camp in the world. It's called Camp Bidi Bidi. And when we were there like maybe three months ago, there was 270,000 people in it. And that was only within like, it's, it's one of the newest refugee camps. And out of that 270,000, 180,000 were children. And we're like, it's pretty, pretty depressing if you think about it. So uh, we said, why don't we just, we, you know, we're, as I said, we're having a beer and then we had two beers and three beers and we're like, let's go to Uganda. <laughs> so um, then let's go to Camp Bidi Bidi and build an installation, da da da. And, we're just, and so we booked our flights and then we met again and we're like, we'll just book a flight to go over and we'll get all the materials and we'll drive to the camp and we'll just produce art. And then the more we talked about it, we're like, okay, that's a pretty silly idea. We need to find people on, on, on the ground level there and um, work with them. So we ended up reaching out to um, World Vision and said, can you help us get into the camp? And, you know, cause it's, it's not safe either. And so they did and they facilitated us. So we went over and they did, they, cause there were so many kids, they started building these, um, schools, but they're very basic, just concrete walls with holes for, for windows. So we went over there and just sort of worked with the kids and decorating those spaces and just sort of made them a bit more of interest with them. So we ended up doing a few of them there, we were there for two weeks and it was like really good learning, just like it was uh, Liberia, like we handed it over to these kids, let them do it and take ownership of it and, um, and like it was just the most memorable thing ever because we went over thinking like we're going to teach these kids about this and this and this and we ended up actually learning the most like especially about societies and stuff like that the society that we live in like like our sense of community is sort of so disjointed right now because of simple things that like these devices in our pockets every day and um social media and whatnot and when i was there there was like such a reliance on family and the community and it was really it was like it was actually life changing like you know we, we left going oh my god it's um so we left wanting to do more so we're going to go back next year um with bigger budgets to create videos and installations that we can share because it's pretty much about um awareness is it so we were using this artwork as a tool for that to create awareness and also for the kids to take to break them um how to say like they're in that camp every day doing the same shit every day and um, starving and just sitting around so we came in as these novelty white guys and broke that norm for two weeks and got to paint with us and chat and have that experience so that's what we're going to do more of and that's something that i've learned with my work is that like um, as precious as it can be about the aesthetics, it pretty much is just a tool or, or a facilitator um, for different purposes. Like, and I'm totally comfortable with that. Like, you know, it's, so like this work is just very linear and abstract and sometimes it's wrong, but that's okay because it's purpose is different than just being aesthetically pleasing, you know? So, um, so that's the last photo of it there. Like you can see one of the schools, we did a few of them around and you can see just some of the kids in the space. And that's it, actually, that's the last slide. <laughs> um, so, um, thanks for listening to me. And I don't usually do a lot of presentations, so I was just sort of going through that. And uh, it was actually quite nice to look back on some of the projects and see what I've done, but thank you. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yep.
Um, I think they, f from the graffiti and the fine art, um, I think they've just like, it's been a, like I sort of showed a lot of that in chronological order, it's just sort of progressed that way. Um, the relationship really is just, as I said, being in that public space. And so I've just probably brought fine art, if even you call it that, I don't know, back into the public realm. And they just keep jumping, like everything's changing. That's one thing I'm, I'm very, I'm able to adapt quite a lot. I don't mind this being called one thing one minute and something else the next. Like it's okay that it adapts and changes and that's what you have to do really. Um, in relation to the content, and yes. uh, no, because um, I don't think there's because I study topography. What I sort of learned from it that there's no go, like good or bad or right or wrong type typeface, and um, so you can just it, you can't you know okay if I was, if you're going to do a gothic. Um, if the if the con if the content is something gothic, yeah, you could use a gothic typeface, but I think that's a bit obvious. Like for for the typefaces that I used um, with that Damien Dempsey project, they're us. Um, I actually ended up using an American typeface and a, and a, a Dutch typeface. Now, could have went with the Irish typefaces to coincide with it being the Irish identity, and but I was just like, why? Like I think these aesthetically work better. So. Um, no, I don't. I think it's whatever feels right, and maybe I, I, I just inherently know that because I study topography. I can aesthetically know that sits well with that. That's going to look great, twenty foot on a wall, and so it's going to look really well if it has to be six inches big, you know. So, um, you yeah, know, I'd, I'd actually find that limiting if you had to do that. I think I think you'd be looser about it. Oh. Uh, you said the, uh, the motel stayed up for two years. Were the buildings eventually torn down? Yeah, the, um, the, the, the Petrus, the gas station, um, we painted out in December and there was a huge storm in January. Uh, that came through and it like, uh, sort of wrecked the, build, wrecked the gas station a bit, but then everyone got rallied together and we painted it. And it stayed up for, I think, two and a half years. And then the city wanted to extend the train station next door, so they demolished that and they're, they're redeveloping it. So, a lot, like, I'm not too precious about it because, as I said at the start, I've I painted thousands of pieces and lost them all, and I don't even have photos of some of them. That you've just become sort of used to it. So, if you got your photo and people got what they wanted from it, after a while, you're okay with letting it go, you know. Oh, paint-wise? Yeah. <laughs> um, I was actually just driving um, towards the lake there yesterday and saw some really nice buildings. But Jason knows that road. Where's Jason? What was that street? Remember, it's like, what's this area called? Oh, we're going, uh, we're at Johnson Yeah, there's a street there that saw some nice walls. But like, um, yeah, your, your, your view of the city is always different when you're, when you're painting murals. But to be honest, like, I actually treat Madison as like my downtime when I chill time. And so, I had, as I said, I came straight from Israel to Lisbon, Portugal, straight to here, and I got here. And so I feel like a week in the studio with good people. I don't have to paint outdoors in the heat. And then, so I'm not, my radar isn't on so much, like, you know, so. But uh, that lake is amazing, by the way. Those lakes, like, I just went for a walk there. Oh, unbe unbelievable, beautiful. Yeah, like it comes at age. Well, what gained was I didn't have to sleep on a sofa anymore. I could like rent, I could rent an apartment, and uh, so that was good. Um, what was lost was probably also with age. You know, like the drive of like getting up and going out in the middle of the night didn't tickle me anymore. Like you know, I, I enjoyed investing my energy and time into bigger projects that had more scope, and uh, so it wasn't that like. I felt I was leaving something behind. It was actually just a natural progression. And um, 
you know, you lose all these pieces, you only have photos and the photos are gone, and they're quick installations that maybe you do go, well, it would be nice to have something more sustainable, something more substantial, I mean, sorry. So yeah, I just, I, I don't feel as if I've lost out on anything. Maybe like street cred, like to 16 year olds the odd time, but like, but nah, that's all right, I'm okay with that. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's it's hard because like I'm never really looking back. Like I'm looking back there, and that's what I try to make. I was like, I'm actually grateful for looking back on the work. Um, I'm just constantly going, like, and I'm just going with it. And I think the more work you produce, the snowball effect. Other people will see it, and you know, even the work that I'm creating with Tandem, I'm sure someone random will see that. And uh, it's not orchestrated, or there's nothing really. I don't have an agent. I don't, I have galleries that represent me, but they don't dictate what I do. I, I make my own decisions and it's just, just sort of goes, like you'll just get a, an email in the inbox or you might get a reference from someone that someone wants to talk to. Um, I think for me, what I tried to say earlier with that gas station, when I did that and that moment that people came in, I was like, I've created like an experiential painting. Now it wasn't this, but for me it was this big haha -ha moment. I was like, here, I, this is like, I can really work on this now. And that led me to do all those installations and woodwork pieces and, and no other graffiti writer or street artist was doing that then. You know, um, you know we're, we were also painting walls and doing stuff on paper and canvas. So that was a real turning moment for me, yeah, for sure. No, whatever. Yeah, <laughs> they stayed. <laughs> Are you off? No, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Friday night, yeah. Okay, take care. Ah, oh, thank you, I appreciate it. Thanks, thanks. Real nerve wracking standing up there. It's really nerve wracking. Okay. Oh, okay. I'm actually surprised people have questions. In Ireland, be like, no, no. Everyone's too shy, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I sure do. Is there three more? What? Is there three more? So we just take a couple of more questions and I'll use the couple um, loosely. I think that lady there, yes. Can you talk a little about why Arkansas was a good match for you personally or artistically? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, no, so I, when was it? Okay, it's pretty personal. I'll tell you, I'll tell you the truth. Um, so at the time, I got invited, I got an email, and it was from a guy called Steve Clark, and he um, said, hey, I got the skate park, will you come paint it? Come paint the mural. I was like, yeah, okay, no problem. Uh, Sounds interesting, I didn't know who he was, and I was like, yeah, just book a flight, and we'll come over, can I bring a friend? He'll be my videographer. And um, so we went over, and we clicked really well with this guy, Steve, like instantly he was like, he was, um, he was a, a businessman and he opened up the skate park, but the intention of the skate park was more than just having kids skating. It was uh, to teach them business, like in a practical sense. And then he used us as like, look at this guy from Ireland coming over and living his life, you know, his best life and painting murals. And so he was using me as like an example, you know, and got to work with the kids. Um, so 
We were there for a week and then we had rented a car to go to South by Southwest, drive to Texas, and we were meant to go, let's say, go on the Friday. And we bonded so well with this guy that, like, at the time, I was, like, emailing my girlfriend going, this is really weird, like, this guy is, like, we're, we're like, getting on way too good, like, you know, it's like, he was, like, the dad I never had, and I was, like, the son he never had, even though he has sons. But, like, um, so... There was like so I didn't I didn't leave and we left finally on the Monday but like there's no tears like it was really strange like we really really bonded so we stayed in contact and then um, he invited me back for like two he said do you want to come back and at that time in my life um, a few things that happened and my cousin had just passed the same for then my uncle had committed suicide and then my granddad had died all within like an eight month period so it was just pretty like overwhelming for me and our family so. Me being me, I just wanted to run away. And so Steve, um, I said, hey, do you think I'll come over for two weeks? And he had a big ranch in Oklahoma, which is on the border of uh, Arkansas. And he said, yeah, so I flew over and ended up sp spending two months there. And we bonded really well. And um, over those two months, yeah, I just sort of fell in love with like the pace of life there. It was just really easy going. Maybe timing had a lot to do with it, but you know, this guy was great. He was a great mentor to me business, artistically, like personally, like, you know, he was just a, just a great guy. So um, my girlfriend came over and visited, because uh, I had an exhibition and we stayed for two months and I was just painting all the time. So he um, he put together like a pop-up exhibition and I got to meet a lot of the, the locals there in this town called Fayetteville, because I was there in Fort Smith, which is like an hour away. Um, are you, you're obviously familiar with Arkansas. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so Fort Smith's, Fort Smith's a business, like, you know, so it's like real working man town, but like, there's something really endearing about the place, so, um, so that was it, yeah, and then um, I just, I was in this kitchen one day looking at his horses, whatever, and I was just like, I'd, I'd like to move here, and uh, he's like, well, I can make that happen if you want, I can help you with your visa, was, uh, you know what he's mean, because you need a sponsor to get into the States. And so I said to my girlfriend, and she was like, yeah, fuck my job. She quit her job, and she, <laughs> she came with me. And um, we, we, we lived there for two years, and uh, it was super. I was traveling loads at the time then, because the way it usually works is like, when I was living in Europe, there's loads of work in America, so I'm traveling loads. Then I moved to America, and all the work was in flipping Europe. So I was traveling back and forth all the time. Um, but it was great, and we made some great friends, and. And then it just it ran its course a little bit. It came a little bit inconvenient, like because having to fly from Arkansas to Chicago, and then Chicago back to Dublin. I was I was doing it like every two weeks or so. So we just moved back then after a while. But um, yeah, it was a great place. Yep. One of your friends that you started off in high school doing Um, so the guys in the photo that you saw were like they were doing sketches. That one guy's Cameron, and he was from LA, and he had to move over to Ireland because he was a prominent graffiti writer, and he got shot at, and his, one of his friends got shot, and his parents are freaking out, so like you have to move to Ireland to your sister to get out of trouble, and then he met me, and uh, <laughs> so he's still good. He like we were friends on Instagram. He moved back to the states a few years later. The other guy was Colm Tullin. He's a Jehovah Witness, and so like you can see like this mix of people you meet. Like it's not like a football or like well you guys football. I mean soccer like or sports where it's quite localized. Like everyone's from the same community or social stature. Graffiti like really taught us like you know you, you hung out with like some of the craziest kids ever and some of the poshest kids ever. But it didn't really matter. It was just your um, how good you were at painting. So, um, yeah, so Colm is now in South America building houses, still um, as part of his uh, Jehovah Witness thing. Um, and so he's doing that and still painting bits. We just share each other's work on social media. But um, other than that, yeah, there's like, I'm still good friends with loads of the guys in Dublin, yeah, that we hung out with and painted with, and I lived with a few of them for years. and. And they've all, they've all progressed into different avenues of creative, like post-production or graphic design or whatnot. So we're all still in contact, yeah. Yep. Have you done any uh, follow-up with your humanitarian work? Or what kind of long-term impact does your work have here? So, yeah, like, uh, I would never label it as that because, but that's, I guess, what it is. Like, we were going, like, a lot of the re a lot of things I'm doing, as I said, are quite impulsive. And it's like, I've never been to Uganda. What a crazy experience that will be. And then it's rewarding in this way and that. So let's just go. 
But um, so I went there, I'm just taking that as an example because I'm looking at it. Um, it became, um, this is like the training ground. This is like the, the first stage. So we went and I was, I was just evaluating everything. Now I get offered loads of great opportunities all the time and I pretty much stupidly turn them down. But one, one uh, company who got onto me a week before I went there was Red Bull. And they were like, hey, we want to like put your artwork on a million cans and give you blah, 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 amount of money to do whatever you want. And so my next, so I connected the dots on the stairs. I was like, what can we do? So I'm going to approach them next to do. A, so at the, on the last day here in Uganda, the kids are actually all queuing up because they're, they're being allowed to sit down to a performance. The kids are going to perform to us as a thank you for being there. And so all these kids come out in tribal wear and headdresses and drums and they did this like dance routine that was like hypnotic, it was in this circular sort of motion. Some went that way, some went the other way and just drums and it was amazing. And at that moment I saw like I could make a music video out of this and build an art installation and have the kids in it and then that would be a great way of, instead of like doing these sympathy videos, you know, that you see with Concern and UNICEF, it was like kid having to walk two miles so well, I get it, but like it doesn't really draw, I think we're, we're too conditioned to see that now and I thought this is going to be a great way of doing this. So we're going to go back again with a proper budget, go in and build an art installation, get the kids involved, make this music video to whatever music, their music, whatever. And then we'll have, we'll use Red Bull social media as a vehicle to share that. And then whoever else will pick up on it. And so that'll be an extension of it. Um, the day of us, a thing where I made that medical, got that medical van. Um, that was very organic. Like we just, did that, put, called on friends, that was like 2009, 10. With no money, I was sleeping on a couch, like I was sleeping on a friend's couch at that time. And uh, and so that got great momentum. So that's like in 2020, I'm gonna do like an anniversary of that. I'm gonna bring in more musicians and more artists and I'll sort of take a step back and we're gonna try and do a mural in every county, which would be like the equivalent of every state. Um, it's obviously on a smaller scale. Um, but we're going to do that over that year and celebrate that and do a book and whatnot. And there'll be a return in that as well. Like, How old is this piece? This? I was just there, uh, th this was just a few months ago. I was, uh, I'm really bad at dates because I'm all over the place, but like maybe April <laughs> or March, something like that. Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, pretty much came back from graffiti. Um, you wanted your work to pop out when it was on the street. You wanted it to be see, seen and light, light, like be loud. And so there's simple colour theories that you'd use. You'd put like hot and cold colours together, contrasting colours. So if the inside of your letters were, let's say, orange and red, you'd put like a blue outline or a black outline to contrast it. So I picked up like a lot of understanding of colour. Um, my colour palette now that I have, even while, while I'm using my tandem, is uh, there's eight colours and they don't change. And because there's enough of a spectrum, eight colours in black and white, and uh, there's enough of a colour spectrum there for me to use. And so that stays the same for all my projects. And it covers all the light colours, like the light warm colours, yellow, orange, red, and then uh, baby pink, magenta, mint, baby blue, navy. And you can, you can have your light colours and dark colours. And once you just, there's loads of, there's actually 35 different colour combinations between those eight colours. If it, and I've got it all laid out. And the reason I have it laid out is because then it becomes this um, blueprint. If a project is happening and I can't get there yet, I can send them the colour references. This is how it is. Don't ever put these together. These are your colour options if you have to hand it over. And so I've limited my palette, but it's become a really good, Con uh, concise like toolbox of colours that don't change, you know, I don't need to. Occasionally I might skew it a little bit because they might have the right colour and they can change it, but it also then gives me a continuity across my work, you know. One more. One more. Mm. 
yeah, it's uh, it's project by project really. I'm lucky that like I can definitely say everyone that works with me, I'm I'm lucky that everyone is just cool. It's shit like I'm so lucky. Like I don't know how it's happened, but everyone is really nice and really enthusiastic when they work and devoted fully. At home, I have like an assistant, Dara, and he is sort of like the guy on ground level there for me. And so anytime, like when I fly back now after here, he'll already be down at the next mural, getting prepared, getting stuff set up. Um, he would be my assistant for when I have shows. But then it's project for project, like Tandem Press, they've got their crew of people. And then if I'll go to, where am I going to? I'm going to Florida to paint a mural. And so the, the university there will, I'll say, look, it's best to have like eight volunteers. We might need two qualified people to drive a lift if, I, if I'm not there. So, um, and then those big builds, those big, big projects, you'll get a pro I'll always ask for like um, um, a project manager because they need to be at, at that location if I'm away and they'll, then they'll um, hire crew and do all that sort of stuff. So yeah, it's project for project. But at home, if I need something built, I've got like my go-to guys that you've seen a picture of earlier. Um, they, 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 they build all my stuff as well. But, as I said, it just depends on, it's not like a full-time staff, no. It keeps me quite versatile then, it's, it's fine. Okay, let's give Nazir one more break. <laughs>